Join me on a wild adventure as we watch a grown man lose his mind and build the world's largest chocolate bar. Hello there everyone. Thanks for joining me for episode two of the build series showing my construction of my N-Gage Inglenook shunting layout. Today we're going to cover, amongst some other things, the wiring and the electronics of the layout. And let me tell you, for something so small, it is unreasonably complicated. I'm going to go into a fair bit of detail, um, and this episode is going to be a bit more of a tutorial than the first episode because this is the part of the build that I found the most tricky and it's the part that I had to spend the most time planning to be reasonably confident that it was going to work out so I'm hoping what I show you will be helpful if you're planning your own layout. Things are going to get pretty technical but don't worry I'm going to be here to hold your hand along for the whole journey. If you haven't seen episode one yet I'm going to shamelessly plug myself on the internet and recommend that you go ahead and watch it. There's a link in the description below. But as a quick recap of where we were, we left episode one with our track cut, dropper wires added, and the track was sat loose on the lovely pink extruded foam sheet. The chocolate spreading step from the intro was of course brown poster paint, um, which I was using to hide the uh, pink shade of the foam, as lovely as it is, it isn't particularly realistic. Now for the first step of episode two, we're going to look at gluing the track down. To glue the track in place, we're going to be using PVA. It's a little bit awkward as the wires are poked through the holes in the baseboard and I don't want to have to pull them up and push them back down again once the glue is on there and I would make a huge mess if I did that. So I just took my time with it and used the brush to get the PVA in the right place and then as usual left it overnight to set. A quick note on the cork versus no cork debate. In my opinion, at least in N-Gage, it's unnecessary. The sleepers are thick enough to give you a decent ballast shoulder if you ballast to the top of the sleepers and in regards to any noise dampening abilities I reckon by the time you've glued all your ballast over the top, the whole thing's going to be pretty rock solid in the gate, any uh, noise cancellation the cork might provide. So I've decided to um, just glue my track straight to the baseboard. So let's get to the main meat of this episode and start looking at some of the electronics and wiring. You may remember this image from episode one. It shows where the positive and negative dropper wires need to be fitted to the track. You may also remember me saying that the layout will be wired primarily for DCC operation, which makes things pretty simple. With DCC control, as we're essentially directly controlling the locomotive rather than just powering up all the track, all we need to do is connect all of the back rails together and all of the front rails together, and the layout will operate as we expect. So if we go ahead and do that in diagram form, we end up with something like this. All of the rails towards the front of the layout have been connected together and they will be the positive side. And all the rails towards the rear of the layout have been connected together and they will be the negative side. For connecting all my dropper wires together and for any other things on the layout which need to be connected together, rather than trying to splice things and um, making a huge mess, I'm using these terminal blocks. You can get them in different lengths, ranging from 2 to 20 or more connections. And basically, in each row, each corresponding pair is connected to one another. So, if you want to have everything on the terminal block connected to one another, you can use these little clips which just bolt in as if you would bolt in any other wire and 
they basically mean that everything on the other side of the terminal block will be in continuity when bolted up. To connect your actual wires you use these little spade clips and uh, you can solder or crimp these on to whatever wires you have and then you've got a nice bolt on, bolt off solution that uh, looks super neat and it's easy to service if you have to change anything. So before we bolt anything down, I've just started by laying out approximately where I think a lot of the components are going to go. This isn't set in stone, but it's just to give me an idea of where I'm going to put stuff. You can see the two large terminal blocks on the bottom left hand side, which are going to account for all our dropper wires. And by looking at this, I was pretty happy that if I put them there, I was still going to have room to put everything else when uh, the time came. Don't worry about understanding everything at the minute because I'm going to go through what all the other components do as uh, we add them to the baseboard. Once I was happy with the position of everything, I can attach the terminal blocks. They each just have two screws, one on either side, so they're pretty easy to mount to the underside of the baseboard. With the terminal blocks mounted and still having the other components loosely fitted to make sure I wasn't putting wires in the way of stuff. It was just a case of running through everything and making the connections. It was a fair bit of soldering and crimping and to be honest it doesn't make for interesting viewing which is why we're watching it in a very condensed form and at about a million miles an hour. However despite this being a little bit of a slog my motivation was super high because I knew as soon as I had this done, I'd be able to run some engines on my layout. With that process done, we couldn't use the points or anything like that, but we had all of the track live. So once again, I couldn't resist putting down the little engage locomotive and giving her a test and making sure all of the electrical feeds on the layout were working. And it all looked good. So that's the first stage of the wiring done and it's certainly nice to be in a place where we can run some locomotives on the track. That was really the simple stage and although it took a little bit of time, there was not a lot of complication to the setup. Now we're going to move on to wiring in the point motors and that's where things do start to get pretty complicated. So let's have a look at this rather scary looking diagram and see if we can break it down a little bit. I'm going to go into this in a fair bit of detail because this is the bit which had me stumped for quite a while. So if anyone else is stuck in a similar situation, I'm hoping I can help you out. We've got our most important pieces at the top here, and that's our point motors. Each one of them can move in two directions and as their outputs, they also have a, an ability to feed the frog of all the points uh, to keep our electrical continuity good while the uh, engines are moving over the points. They basically have two inputs um, and that is to move in either direction. Now the points themselves, they are obviously a, a solenoid style motor and they need a fair lump of charge to make sure that they're going to move every time because they have to overcome the spring in the points amongst other things. You know, if you've got um, dirt or anything else in the mechanism, that's going to add some friction. So then to make sure that we're providing them with a big lump of current, we're going to use something called a capacitor discharge unit, which is marked here as CDU. Basically, capacitor discharge unit is just like a fancy bank of capacitors what we can do is we can kind of trickle feed them with power and then the discharge unit will give us a big whack of power when we activate it. Here's an image of the CDU I chose to use. It's from Block Signaling. It's called CDU2C. You can see the inputs and the outputs on the left hand side there in the light blue sort of boxes. It's just power in and power out. Super simple. To explain it in a relatively crude manner, it's kind of like the cistern on your toilet. 
that gets drip fed by the water system and then when you push the flush all the water comes out at once. If you've ever held down the flush lever you will see the kind of pitiful way the water comes out and it's not going to deal with all your issues shall we say. So that explains the point motors, the point frogs and the CDU on that diagram. The CDU is just fed by the 16 volt AC from the wall and um, that goes through the little 3D printed bezel we looked at last time. We can disregard the lighting circuit on the bottom left hand side for now and that just leads us to the relay array, the 9 volt batteries and the switches. You'll see I've marked a section at the bottom with a control box. That's basically an external switch box that I'm going to be using to move the points on the layout. Because it's so small, I don't want to have something actually mounted to the baseboard itself because I want to be able to put the railway somewhere, hold the switch box in my hand and you know maybe it's set up on a coffee table or something like that. But basically what that means is that I don't want to have lots of wires and lots of thick wires running to this control box because it's going to end up with a big horrible cord going to it that's going to make life difficult. And as we spoke about with the CDU, that provides a big lump of current to the point motors and to facilitate that we have to have very thick wires or at least relatively thick wires in comparison to the other ones used on the layout and also we want to keep them as short as possible which obviously neither of those things are very good if you're trying to use an external switch box. So to kind of get around that I'm using a bank of relays to carry the high current circuit and I'm switching those relays with a very low current circuit just using a 9 volt battery based within the baseboard. This 9 volt battery obviously has a very low current which means I can use some very thin wire and run that out to my switch box and that keeps things nice and light and also the cable is not going to be really thick and cumbersome. So I need six relays, one for each direction of the three points and I'm not going to go into a huge amount of depth as to how a relay operates but essentially it's an electronic switch. We can use a low current circuit to activate a small electromagnet in the relay and that activates the high current circuit. As you can see I'm just using a little 9 volt battery and um, I'm not too worried about the battery life because when you're throwing the switch you only activate the motor for a couple of tenths of a second if not less so the amount of energy used each time is quite low, even if the power is quite high. So if we have a quick look at the relays, each one that I have has four little pins, that's because they're just single pole, single throw relays. Two of the pins correlate to the low voltage side with the coil, which is the electromagnet side, and two are the high voltage side. Here I'm just using some um, crocodile clip wires I'm connecting a 9 volt battery to the low current side and I've connected my multimeter to the high current side in continuity mode so it will beep when there's continuity and when I touch that little leg of the crocodile clip to the relay you can hear that the multimeter then reads continuity and you can also see on the readout that the resistance reading goes from an open circuit to essentially zero. So let's start by throwing one of the switches on the switch box in imaginary land on this diagram. These switches just here in the bottom left. We can see when we do that, that completes the circuit with the 9 volt battery and the relay on the bottom left hand side. This in turn activates the CDU which is drawing power from the wall supply. And then once the CDU has been activated, that sends power to the point motor and that moves the point motor in the corresponding direction and feeds the frog in the 
correct polarity as well. So hopefully I haven't lost everyone there, hopefully that wasn't too boring. Now we're going to jump back into actually building some stuff. And first of all we're going to start mounting the relays. I've printed some little cradles for them, mounting them in pairs which corresponds to each motor. And the cradles themselves just screw to the underside of the baseboard and the relays just push into the cradle so that keeps things nice and simple. So we're going to essentially gloss over the actual process of wiring up the layout. It was very, very repetitive and I worked on it over the course of a few evenings. It's very difficult to get good footage of this. It's essentially just me soldering and crimping lots and lots of connections. There's a huge volume of wiring here, particularly considering how tiny the layout is and I only have three points to throw. I actually ran into a bit of an obstacle where I was struggling to find places to mount all of the electronics that I was using and all the terminal blocks and other things, which is probably quite unusual, I would say, for, for a railway layout that there's not actually enough room on your baseboard to mount everything. But in the end it did fit and I was actually very surprised to find that essentially all I did was I executed the plan that I had come up with and it worked, which was a really nice feeling. You can see here when we look at the baseboard fully assembled, just how tight all the content is when it's under there. And the final piece of the puzzle to all this, which we've just mentioned previously, is the switch box itself. This little fella is what I'm using to hold my three switches which throw the points and I also have a toggle switch on the right for if I add any lights to the layout. The point switches naturally move to the center on kind of like a spring uh, mechanism I presume and they can go in each direction so one switch for each point and it can move it in both directions. In the switch box and in the uh, baseboard layout itself, I'm using these neat little Molex connectors. These take a crimped terminal and uh, you can get them in multiple sizes. I'm using two and 10 pin versions. And uh, I'm using these to keep everything nice and neat and particularly on the switch box, the cable that joins it to the baseboard is a 10 pin connector because I need uh, nine wires, I believe, off the top of my head to uh, carry all the signals. The switch box was printed on my Ender 3 in four different pieces, and uh, it includes a lid with some button head screws to hold it on, and they go into those nice Ruthex uh, thermoset inserts that we've used before. If we have a little look inside, you can see just how busy everything is in there. The one thing about using these connectors on something so small is they actually take up a fair bit of room. Um, if I was going to do this all again, I would have made the switch box maybe 10 or 20 mil larger so that I could have fitted everything in a little bit more neatly. You can also see there hiding in the back a little mini bus bar I made out of a strip of aluminium. That's so that all of the switches can share a common feed from the 9 volt battery and that reduces the amount of wires I need to and from the switch box. And here you can see the cable itself being connected into the switch box. The cable is actually an off the shelf component that you can buy. Um, so it's basically bundled individual wires and uh, they just clip in through the Molex connector in the back. The final step to neaten this all up is to come back and trim the axles of the point motors that go through the little levers on the, on the points themselves. I was doing this with my uh, Dremel multi-tool and one piece of advice here is to cool everything down with a little bit of water and keep applying water because otherwise you're going to melt all the plastic on the points. Don't ask me how I found that one out. And now after all that work, we can bask in the beautiful clack clack noise of all three point motors moving in the correct directions. Oh 
Yeah. So that's the wiring and the electronics pretty much done. I did tell you it was going to get complicated, but hopefully that all made sense. Now that that's done, we can run our locomotives up and down the layout and we can also move the points in the correct direction. The next functional thing to take care of is to fit the magnets for the DAPL easy shunt couplings. These couplings allow us to automatically decouple wagons when the decouplers are over some magnets which you plant into your baseboard. They also have the secondary benefit of actually looking quite a bit nicer than the normal Rapido couplers you get. They're roughly the same size but they look a little bit more functional rather than a big lump of plastic. So to facilitate the uncoupling DAPL do sell a magnet which you can fit. It's from what I can tell designed to be fitted at sleeper height and because it's so big you have to cut away a whole load of sleepers and it looks pretty ugly. So the solution I'm going to look into is using some off-the-shelf neodymium magnets. These, if you get them in the correct size, can be just pushed down between the sleepers and as I'm using a foam baseboard, I can easily compress them into the foam and that holds them in place. Actually fitting the magnets in between the rails can be a little bit tricky. Whilst they do push in nicely to the foam which holds them temporarily and they fit nicely in between the sleepers, we can quite easily fix in place the first row with some super glue without too much issue. But then once you start trying to bring in the second rev magnets, we come into issues because they're trying to repel each other. It's kind of like if you've ever tried to assemble all your pets together to take a picture of them, trying to uh, get them all to stay in shot is pretty much impossible. The trick here is to use something non-metallic to hold the magnets down. In my case, I had an offcut of a cable tie which I use and that allows us to get everything glued down. It's just a case of adding each row, gluing it, giving the super glue a few minutes to set, and then continuing on until you've put all of the magnets in that you want. I'm just using a row of four, as you've seen previously. Now that that center siding is done, I can show you them operating. I'm bringing in my little J72 from the right hand side of the screen and then hands free dropping off the wagons. This is super satisfying when it does work. It's not 100% reliable but uh, it's pretty cool and eliminates the hand of God at least when you're trying to decouple wagons. I then went ahead and added magnets for the other two sidings. So that's the magnets fitted and I've been having a lot of fun doing some of the Inglenook shunting puzzle without having to touch the layout at all which is really cool. Um, it's very satisfying not having to get your hand in there because with the end gauge wagons being so small when you try and decouple them you just end up derailing everything. So it's really good that we've got a nice solution for that. Now that that's done, and with a good test of the electronics being carried out, it's time to build the lid for the underside. Now that we've got everything done, we might as well build that, and then we don't have to worry about working on the bottom of the baseboard anymore. So let's take a look at the lid. So I've gone ahead and cut out the outline of the lid. It's a few mil undersized to the lip of the underside of the box. So I've got a little bit of a tolerance there and I've drilled a hole in each corner where the plinths are which have those nice little brass Ruthex thermoset inserts and now I'm opening those holes up with a spade bit and the reason I've opened them up so much is because they don't take the fastener directly they take these little 3d printed parts and the reason I made these is because I want to inset the fastener so that you're not dragging a metallic bolt head across whatever surface you've got the layout on. And here you can see the lid and 
the lid after it's had some wood finish applied to it, which I think looks really nice. Then it's just a case of, once the finish is dry, taking the four 3D printed parts and just putting on a little bit of super glue to attach them. The loads are always going to be in compression, so I'm not too worried about these coming loose because the bolts essentially hold them on anyway. Once they're all done, we can drive the fasteners in. I'm using four cap heads. I think they're either M5 or M6, and there's a fairly large washer underneath them. That's so that I didn't have to position those 3D printed parts too accurately and uh, the bolts will still go in. And I think once it's all done, it all looks pretty professional. I'm, I think the, uh, the silver of the bolts and the black of the 3D printed parts with the wood grain and the blue of the baseboard, I think the colors all work pretty well together and it looks pretty professional. But hey, wait one cotton pick a minute, I hear you cry. What's that nasty looking block on the right hand side of the baseboard? Well, my young friends, let me tell you a tale of pride and stupidity. I thought I had planned everything correctly. I thought I had checked the track plan enough times. But alas, I made not one, but two fatal mistakes. The Inglenook shunting puzzle layout requires three sidings, each with a specific length. Room for five wagons in the top, three in the middle, and three in the bottom. Technically, my three sidings do fit this criteria, but what I had failed to take into account was one, the space required for the buffer stops, and two, the magnetic decouplers. When you factor these two things in, I don't have enough room on my layout. If we look at this freeze frame from the video I showed you previously of the magnets in action, we can note two things. One, that the three wagons take up the entirety of the center siding and there is no buffer stop fitted to that siding. And also, in this position, the decoupler on the right-hand wagon is over the magnets. Now, when the decoupler is in this position, it is forced open by the magnetic pull and you can't connect anything to it. All I would be able to do is rub my locomotive up to the back of it like a lonely man on a nightclub dance floor, unable to make any kind of real connection. I did consider just living with this and running the Inglenook in a 422 format, but that didn't seem ideal. And I also considered doing away with the magnetic decouplers and only using my shortest wagons but again, I didn't like this solution. The only real solution, the only way to get what I actually wanted, would be to extend the baseboard by 50 millimeters and graft on some more track so that my sidings on the right hand side were a little bit longer. You can see on the lower image there, I've added into the AnyRail planning software blue squares to represent the areas where there are magnets and I've brought in some buffer stops which are actually part of the NRL software which you can see on the right hand side and this longer 850 millimeter layout can accommodate both of these with plenty of room left for the appropriate amount of wagons. So that's where we're going to leave it for episode two. I don't mean to leave it on a bit of a bitter note with that mistake coming to light, but the positives to look back on are that the layout is essentially all wired up. We can run trains, we can move the points, and also we've made a nice looking lid which covers all the electronics. In terms of having to extend the baseboard, well, it goes to show you that even if you plan things out as much as you can, it's easy to overlook things and there's no use in me trying to cover up my mistakes, so I'm hoping Maybe that's something you guys can learn from. I do enjoy the woodworking side of things, so having to extend the baseboard isn't all bad because I get to chop up some more bits of wood and make a whole load of mess. And that's something that obviously we're going to cover in episode three, 
So bye for now and I will see you next time.